Good afternoon. I'm delighted to welcome you to this IIEA webinar. My name is Una Fitzpatrick. I'm the Director of Technology Ireland and IBEC Trade Association, and I'll be chairing today's event. Today's event is part of a series organised by the IEA and the IDA Ireland to explore digital policy issues relevant to Ireland. Today's event follows the Digital Ireland Conference, which took place in Dublin Castle in November, which was organised by the IDA. Today's event also follows last, last week's event on transatlantic data transfers, which was jointly organised by EI, IIEA and the IDA. Today's event is on the subject of immersive technologies, including virtual reality, augmented reality and metaverse technologies. We're delighted to be joined today by our expert panel, who have been generous enough to take time out of their schedules to join us. The format of today is that each panelist will speak for about 10 minutes or so, and after each panelist has finished their presentation, we'll go to a Q&A with our audience. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout this, the session as they occur to you, and we will come to them once our spe speakers have finished their presentations. A reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. Do feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. And I'll now formally introduce our speakers and hand over to them. So we'll be joined today by Dr. Martha Brockenfeld, Dean of uh, Metaverse Academy. And then we'll be joined by Peggy Johnson, CEO of Magic Leap. And then finally, Niall Campion, Managing Director of BRAI. So first up, we have Dr. Martha Bockenfeld, um, who is a Metaverse Evangelista, love that one, advisor and speaker who is passionate about emerging tech, blockchain and the Metaverse, and a strong believer in the power of innovation. So I'm delighted to hand over to you um, and look forward to hearing from you. Yeah, thanks a lot for having us today. I think we're also in the three minutes of preparation, we already exchanged some view how important education is and how excited we are all here to be today. So the big question is usually always when people come to us, what is the metaverse? And same as when you ask a lawyer, and I'm I'm a legal person by training, then uh, you get five or six or seven or even more different answers. So what we agree on, I would say most of the people agree on that the metaverse is really the, the future of the internet. Uh, and remember when the internet was developed, also we did never imagine Facebook or any other of, of those use cases. We also agree that the metaverse in its full extent is probably something which will, will be developed over the next five to 10 years. And in its shape, it will have different virtual worlds like we have in the real world. It will be connected also, which I think is a very important point. Some people totally misunderstand with the real world. Uh, so we will talk about some use cases today also with my fellow members here on the panel where you have real use cases where we connect the real world also with the virtual worlds. And it's not only this interconnectivity, which is not yet there, it's also not interoperable, as we say. So if you are in one of the worlds, let's say with a digital twin or with an avatar, you cannot travel yet to the other worlds. Nevertheless, we have a lot of use cases already, and we have a lot of different parts of the society which we, are, which we see, which are changing. Uh, so in the Metaverse Academy, what we do, we try... Uh, to give those experiences, we try to give education to people who usually come to us, not only want the experience, but they start with, I want to have a presence. I want to have a presence in the virtual world without knowing what would be the right virtual world or a wrong one and what they're trying to achieve. So also here for corporates, it's very important to understand what is the, your use case? What are, is it what you are trying to achieve? And what is the added value you want to create? So if you look at some of the prediction in terms of value creation, then we have predictions from, I would say, 5 to 10 to even 30 million billion US dollar in the next decade and a half, or even trillion. So if we say only a friction of that is true, you can imagine that there is an amazing growth opportunity for corporates. Um, so everyone is now thinking of, okay, how do I enter it? And a lot of people are also believers in technology or in emerging technology. And what we see now that we have all this kind of technology, and I'm sure that Peggy will also speak to that and also now coming together. So we're talking about the convergence of AI. Now we have chat GTP where everyone goes crazy and other AI experiences like 
you know, we can just prompt uh, words to, to create stuff. So big creator economy. But we also have in genetic terms, we can have a 3D printing of organs and all of that comes together in one part. And the question is, how do we realize this? How, how do we do this? So one of the things which we will see, for example, in healthcare, which I find the most amazing and most underestimated in terms of those use cases, is that you have uh, doctors training, for example, in the metaverse, in virtual worlds, let's say, let's not use this, overuse this term too much. And they not only train what they have done previously on dead bodies, but they also test virtual operations. So just recently, there was a co-joined um, uh, twin couple, uh, very little babies, very, very difficult to separate in Brazil. And what they have done, they worked with doctors in London, and they had this virtual reality created where they could test, where they were trying everything, and thanks God, it was successful. So these kind of things wouldn't have been possible a year ago. You know? So it's amazing what, for example, in healthcare, you can do. And we haven't even talked about other educational parts, like uh, if you imagine, and I think in the US is also a big thing, the magic school bus. Uh, where you can discover your body inside. So these kind of things, you can go in history lessons. We know that from gaming. And gaming is usually the gateway to virtual worlds. If you think about how many people and how many uh, of, of not only 12 to 25 years, but older people are in the gaming world, we have already 3 billion gamers. Uh, so from a policy point of view, because I know we will talk about this also today, and cyber risk, if you look at the gaming industry, there's a lot of experiences we have there, which we can relate to and which we can basically say, yeah, this shows us a way also from a policy and regulatory point of view, what is happening, what is happening with our task, what is happening with digital currency, because all of that is already being used in gaming. And we, I would say our generation now also at this table, we are the old ones in that sense. We, we don't know, I mean, all my nephews know how to trade in digital assets. They have digital wallets with 12. It's not a problem. And they very often even now starting to have NFTs. So for me, it's very important that we focus uh, not so much on the general term, but when we have a look, what are the use cases and how is it a, a creation of value for, for what we do? So we will also see training from, uh, uh, from the company you are representing here, where it's really helpful when you have military, when you have in sustainability, for example, also people training. This year, beginning of the year, we had at the VEF, I don't know if anyone was there, but also even for politicians, we had training in a virtual world in the sense of what happens with climate change. And it's amazing once you have the headset on and Magic Leap is one of the very, very advanced one, then how you feel about it. And that's, you feel it's real. So everything becomes real. And if you have never tried it, also people on this call, in particular policymakers, I think it's very important that you start trying, that you start feeling it, that you know it's real. Because everyone thinks oh, it's all fake and maybe it's like a ready player, a one where everyone goes to uh, goes to this oasis and the whole world is is dying. No, this is not what we should focus on. We should focus on the possibilities how to create better human behavior, how to create better worlds. And coincidentally, yesterday in the German parliament, and I'm sure that a lot of people have watched this, are, they had a big discussion about the metaverse and Web3. There were a lot of Web3 critics there. So there's a lot of discussion going on in Germany as well. Can we apply the current regulatory framework now also to the new world? And I would say, uh, no, <laughs> no, you can't, because it's developing and you have to acknowledge this. And if we also look at the gap between how fast it is developing, which is exponential, compared to what we have as regulatory framework today, then it's a huge gap between the two. 
So some of the statistics don't only show we have trillions of, uh, of revenues coming, growth coming from the metaverse, but Gartner also estimates that 25%, that's one fourth of the population, will be in the metaverse at least uh, one hour a day in the next couple of years. So it's fast. 70% of brands, according to KPMG, will have a presence in the metaverse. So if we think about all those predictions, and as we know, there is a law saying we usually completely underestimate this, we should all get involved now. And that is something I think all panelists are trying to do, get people involved, get people to understand, get people to know what's coming, and don't leave everything to Meta, Microsoft, uh, they will do it, you will do it, you will be part of this. So remember also our, let's say even maybe parents when they're over 70 years old, they may be not able to do online banking, they may be not able to do WhatsApp. So you are not part of this world and they haven't been shaping it anymore. So become really a shaper of this new world. And that is my, I would say, big data here to everyone, including policymakers. Thanks so much. Um, that, that's really interesting. And I love the concept of being a shaper. Um, I think that's something that, you know, in terms of, of a message to land with people, um, you know, not to be passive um, about this. Um, it, it, it's very apt. Um, so I'm delighted to hand over to, to our second speaker, um, hand over to, to Peggy Johnson, who is CEO of Magic Leap, which is an immersive um, augmented reality technology company. Um, so Peggy, with all the hype around the metaverse and the potential to revolutionize traditional ways of working, there's a disconnect on what the metaverse really is and the technology that it will support. I suppose from Magic Leap's perspective, where do you see the opportunity for augmented reality technology to merge the digital and physical world? Uh, where are we in the cycle of adoption and where are the near term opportunities? Thanks. Thanks, Odo. And thanks for the opportunity to speak uh, to this audience today. I've, I'm very honored. You know, that's a big question. There is a lot of uh, hype around the metaverse, just like any technology when it's first introduced. You, you get a lot of hype about what, what can be, what will be. Um, but I think if we just go back, I'll, I'll give a few definitions, definitions and that may help. Um, at Magic Leap, we, we make a device, a headboard device. Uh, your hands are free. It's just a, a headset. And when you put it on, you still see your physical world. And then we smartly integrate digital content into that. So we're not maybe building the metaverse, but we're building a window into the metaverse. And I think in many ways, the metaverse is here today, um, most notably the way we interact with our phones, with numerous apps, you know, if you're using Google map and it shows you the building that you're trying to find a picture of it that's that's a type of metaverse it's mixing your digital world with your physical world and we do see this continuing to evolve and augmented reality i believe is definitely the next evolution in in making the digital content we already rely on just you know to be used in a more natural and integrated part of our, our lives. So rather than looking down at your phone like we do now to pull out digital content, you'll have a heads up view. You'll be looking around and you know seeing content, digital content in that physical world that can actually help you. And that actually is here today. Um, it's, it's being used in some incredible ways that, that Martha touched on, um, both virtual and physical. And virtual, by the way, is when you're wholly inside another digital digital world where you are you put the headset on and you enter a, a digital world and then augmented is is really that augmentation of your physical world but both ar and vr make up the metaverse and we believe though that in the longer term ar is the technology that probably will deliver the most value to corporates um martha was talking about you know the value that that corporates can get Right now, today, it can already be found in operating rooms, um, both as training, but also as an aid during complex surgeries. We can, our devices, um, it's gone through the regulatory approval to take it into an operating room, but literally the surgeon can look down at the physical patient in front of them and a digital overlay can, can be put on the patient. For instance, if they're doing knee surgery, that can help them with an incision. Um, it just it makes people more productive. You can think of it as a tool to do their job better. Uh, factory floor workers can be more productive. They typically work with their hands 
And you can think of this as a PC on their eyes. Um, the, the example I like to use is in training. We've got companies now who are reducing their training time from three weeks to three days because you can actually put somebody right out onto a factory floor much more quickly rather than perhaps sitting in a classroom and going through presentations and looking through manuals. It just comes to life. You can walk up to a machine that's gone offline. You can, uh, through the digital overlay or the digital twin, you can walk, you can be walked through how to bring that machine back online and without, you know, having a, a lot of training. So it, it's actually, that not only shortens the training, but it also shortens the time to resolution of getting that device or that machine up and running again. So I just think it's a super exciting time to work in this space. And for me, it, it seems very similar to other major technology revolutions, like the mobile phone over the last 20 years. You know, in the beginning, they just made phone calls. And now, you know, we, we can't live without them. And, and we're just starting to see the potential of uh, augmented reality and virtual reality in, in our worlds today. Um, what, one other point is uh, virtual reality is, is a great training tool. The, the mechanics around it are, are less complex than augmented reality. In augmented reality, you have to, your eyes still have to see your physical world and they have to believe that digital content is actually existing in the digital world. And that optically is a very hard challenge. So it's why you don't see as many augmented reality devices. They're much more complex to, to develop, to, uh, to manufacture as well. We've been doing this for over a decade at Magic Leap and um, we've learned a lot <laughs> along the way and <clears throat> have listened to our customers about what's what feels right on their heads, you know, definitely not heavy, clunky headsets with low quality visuals. It has to be very natural um, as if the content is actually residing in front of their eyes. So that's a big challenge. But you can imagine with that capability, just like with mobile phones, the sky was the limit. You know, you, you can take that capability, you can work it into a number of use cases that can really, really aid and a, a corporate to become more efficient, to shorten times of training, and just to be able to do their job better with this powerful tool on their eyes. So we're very excited about the future. We're just at the beginning. There's a lot you can do with it today, but there's a lot more coming in the future. Super, Peggy, thank you so much. And uh, I, can, I can already see questions coming in. So um, look, looking forward to, to, to putting some of those to you. So I'm delighted to now hand over to, to Niall Campion. Uh, Niall is the founder and managing director of VR AI. Uh, Niall's background is an award-winning editor, director, and visual effects artist working in the film and television industry. Over a 15-year career, he worked on projects for the BBC, Disney, Netflix, RTE, and many more. Niall specializes in technolog technological innovation to tell stories in a more interesting, engaging way. So really looking forward to hearing from you, Niall. Uh, big build up. I hope I live up to the build up. <laughs> and also to the other speakers. Um, yeah, so uh, first of all, I guess thanks for being here and thanks to the other speakers. It's, it's been really interesting to listen and um, never mind present here. Um, and hopefully the audience gets something out of this. I, I guess my role, I hope today, is maybe to talk from a more practical level in terms of how we're actually deploying this technology. And what I hope to do is maybe talk through a few examples of projects we've worked on, both here in Ireland and maybe internationally as well that deploy some of the technology that, that the other speakers have been talking about today. Um, I should say before I start that I'm very jealous of Peggy's current location. I was in Orlando for the last two weeks um, and the temperature difference between there and here is quite significant. While I was there, I also had the opportunity to try the Magic Leap 2 and, and attest to it being an amazing device. It's, uh, incredible. Um, I, I would say maybe before I start as well, maybe getting into too much what we do, like as a company, we're probably hardware agnostic so we don't really support a particular type of headset we don't make headsets we we do the software side of of the metaverse i guess and um, although we kind of more talk about immersive technologies and really as a company what we focus on are training applications and um, i should say we're also or agnostic so they can be talking about AOR, we do vr we also do xor and all the other ors <laughs> or or is one that i like to talk about which is real reality sometimes we end up doing a bit of that too <laughs> And so well, primarily they'll be talking about VR in some of the projects um, I'm, I'm talking about today. So again, there's probably a lot of terminology and I'll try and stay away from sort of the, the or jargons uh, for the most part. Um, so uh, 
maybe to get into then what we do. So as a company, I guess our, our vision for this technology, this immersive technology, is that it's going to change the way people train. So like I said, we're a training company primarily. Um, and we think that technology that was available to like fighter pilots, Formula One drivers, high-end simulation technology that allows these people to practice for their jobs better before being able to do them for real, will become more available to, to other roles. And I know Peggy there was talking about factory floor workers. So we talk about fighter pilots to factory floors and how this technology is bringing simulation technology that was used by fighter pilots to factory floor workers. Um, and so that's kind of the, the vision we set up the company on that we think you know, a simulator that was $20 million can now be made for or delivered for hardware for like a couple of thousand dollars. Um, and so as we were developing these simulators, I guess our main insight as a company is that a VR headset and an AR headset is a great way then of capturing data from individuals as they go through this training. So I think, I can't remember, I think it was Martha was talking earlier about convergence of technologies and that's really something we talk about a lot as well. So like while there's VR headsets, AR headsets, there's also like cloud computing has evolved to the point where you can sort of capture a lot of data and um, stuff like IOT devices where you can sort of start to understand what people are doing. And so really our, our main product as a company is a, a system for capturing, storing, analyzing, they're presenting uh, data back to instructors and trainees as they're going through their training experiences in these simulators. Um, I guess where that insight really came from was in 2018, we did a project with the United Nations in Somalia. And so I went to Mogadishu um, to make a project around how difficult it is to identify roadside bombs uh, from a moving vehicle. I should say primarily, I guess we work in defense security, aviation, and then we do sort of aerospace, logistics, those kind of adjacent industries. But, but I guess most of our work is in defense and security, so I'll probably be talking a bit about that today. And so 2018 with Somalia, made this project. Um, and so the, the sort of basis of the project, which was a VR project, was that you drive down a road, you are tasked with identifying IEDs or roadside bombs from this moving, moving vehicle. And then at the end of the experience, you're given an after action review, which tells you you've driven down this road for 10 minutes in VR, which is a real road in Somalia that I went and filmed in VR. Um, you look around, you point where you think the devices are, and you're told at the end, you've successfully identified one of the five devices that were on that road. And then you're also told, and this is really where our insight came from, that of the four devices you missed, you looked directly at two of them, and you looked at it for like 10 seconds. Because one of the things we can do with the headsets, with VR headsets and AR headsets, is understand exactly where the person is looking down to like 30 times a second or 90 times a second as they move through these experiences. And that becomes quite a powerful learning tool then was our realization. Because when we see that, well, you've missed these two devices, but you've identified this one, when we're training you, we'll just train you on the device you can't identify. And so every individual who goes through the experience maybe will spot a different device. And so rather than sort of a one size fits all training experience, we can start then to cater and individualize the training within, within this technology. And um, so that's really what we built the company on. And like, we've been lucky to be supported by Enterprise Ireland. We've got some private equity investment into the company as well. And, and so we've kind of built this product, which is based in the cloud, uses VR and AR technology in order to train people in a more efficient way. Um, and really where, like, to go to the other end, I guess, of the spectrum then where we're deploying this maybe with fighter pilots at the moment is we're working with the RAF um, to try and codify something called airmanship. So airmanship is defined as the non-technical skills required to operate an aircraft. And so if you think about, I presume there's not many pilots in the audience, but like if you think about driving your car, airmanship is kind of the equivalent to checking your mirrors at the right time or being in the right position in the road, as opposed to the technical skills, which are, you know, what are you doing with your steering wheel? What are you doing with your gear stick? Which gear are you in at the right time? And so it's quite a difficult thing to sort of subjectively or objectively assess because it's down to the individual instructor's impression of what you're doing. And I'm sure everyone's had the experience in a driving lesson or a driving test where they've been told at the end of the lesson, you're failing because you didn't check your mirror. And you go, well, I, I definitely did. But what we can do again with this data capture technology is we can show you after you finished the training that you actually didn't look in your left mirror. You're only looking at the, the rear view mirror or your right hand mirror. And so again, that's kind of, the, I guess, the learning experience we're trying to build. So with the RAF, we're, we're capturing, we've captured 975 million data points from 39 active duty pilots in order to understand and codify this thing called airmanship. And so, We've been probably doing that project for about two years now, and we're, we're pretty confident we're going to be able to do it. Now we're, we're just going to the analysis phase of the data. Um, and so maybe to bring a project a little bit closer to home, we're also working with the Irish Defence Forces, and we've delivered for them probably to go back to the original vision, which is developing or deploying simulation to maybe roles that wouldn't have had access to simulators before. So what we've developed for them is a is a 12-person simulator um, which is deployed in the Cura, which helps them to train on their armored vehicles. So previously they had no simulator for this vehicle. Um, and so obviously it made it quite difficult to train. The only way you could train was to, to 
go down to the yard, get in the vehicle and drive around the field in the car or around Cork or around Galway or wherever these vehicles are based. Um, to do sort of firing exercises using the weapon of the vehicle, you have to get all your crew together. So like up to 100 troops, drive down the motorway to the Glen of Amal, set up a, a range with all the safety requirements that are required for live firing ammunition. And so like my co-founder was in the army for 20 years and he would describe that experience as like, by the time you get to do your training, so when you get to the range to do your firing, you feel like your day's work is done because there's so much logistics involved in organizing it. You know, you get there and maybe one of the vehicles breaks down and then like there's four people who can't train. And so where they're really finding the benefit of this simulation that we've put in is, is, is that like it just allows them to do a greater volume of training for a lesser expense. And again, through our data capture, we're starting to track sort of the, the efficiency of this. Um, and it really, it's, it's, they're, they're showing return on the investment in a couple of different ways. I guess the big one for me is the student to instructor ratio that we're, we're able to change using these immersive technologies at, combined with the data capture. So they've changed the number of students that one instructor can train from three to 12. So one instructor previously could only train three students at a time. Now they can train 12 at a time because they have the confidence that the data is being captured, that they don't need to watch every student all the time. I guess the other big saving, and, and I didn't really talk about sort of our company ethos, but I can talk about that maybe later, but, but the carbon that we're saving on the vehicle. So for every three day course, we're saving two tons of carbon um, just from driving these vehicles around up and down the motorway. So again, that's one of the sort of unseen or un sort of realized benefits of simulation training is that it's actually, you know, in, in an era where we're trying to do less carbon emission, be more efficient, it allows that kind of uh, training to happen. And again, not just for sort of the high end roles, the fighter pilots, but actually for the sort of guys on the ground and the people in factories. Um, you know, traditionally, like one of the other industries we work in is offshore wind. And traditionally, the way offshore wind would train is it would be a central training hub. You don't have to travel to train in the one location. Maybe actually before I leave the defense forces, like, and, and as we're talking about metaverse, like, I think both the other speakers have, have talked about the sort of the ability to network people together. And, and like sort of the core, one of the core principles of the metaverse is that it's lots of people all coming together with physical presence, being able to work together. And so in this simulator that we've put into the current, there are 12 simultaneous users, 12 people in VR headsets sitting in a room all working together. Um, so, you know, it's a core part of how a military would operate. It's a, it's a team-based experience. It's not just a single user practicing on a single simulator. The next phase of this project will allow us to network it across different sites. So if you're based in the Curry, you can train with people in Cork or people in Cork can train with people in Galway. So we can bring 12 people from across the country together to all train together. Um, and so a similar principle applies, I guess, to offshore wind where people would traditionally have come to the one location to train. Well, offshore wind really is an industry that doesn't have that much of a legacy of simulation training. So like one of our, one of our early experiences was um, we're training people in fire safety or fire safety awareness. And the way that's currently trained is you go to a classroom somewhere in the UK or in Ireland, you sit in the classroom for six hours watching PowerPoint presentations. And then at the end of the experience, you go out in the car park and watch the instructor put out a fire in a bin. And so that is the level of qualification you have to put out a fire on an offshore wind turbine. So it doesn't take into account that you're maybe 12 kilometers offshore, you're working at hundred meters in the air, you know, you're, you could be under in waves, five, 10 meters high. And, and how do you sort of reproduce that on land? And the answer is it's quite difficult. So we think, you know, this technology allows people to simulate that. And again, simulate it not just for a single user, but for a crew who go out to repair these turbines. Um, so I guess hopefully there are kind of a few examples of projects that we are working on at the moment that allow, um, or are, this technology is enabling. Um, I'll maybe make two points before, before I wrap up. And, and the first is like, it, it's that, that this technology isn't just maybe a, a, a creative industry. Like it's not sort of like, it shouldn't be thought of like a film industry or like a, a performing arts industry. Like there is certainly that component to it. What really, and I think probably the other two speakers have talked about too, it's, it's about sort of the benefits it can bring to industry and from a, like we are very much a B2B company. Um, and then maybe the other thing I will say, and maybe issue an open invite, like I said, I'm, I'm based in Temple Bar today. And um, we have an office here and, and really the only way to understand this is to try it. So if anybody who is on the call is Dublin based, they'd like to try this technology. Like we have a, an array of headsets in the office, feel free to reach out afterwards. I'm happy to give demos to anyone who'd be interested in seeing it. Fantastic, Niall. And I think you'll, you'll definitely be inundated or request. <laughs> Maybe uh, after Christmas, in the new year, please. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but it's fantastic. And I, and I, you know, I definitely I think in terms of, you know, the sustainability points that you make. And, you know, we hear a lot about kind of the green and digital transition. Um, but I love the practical examples, you know, in terms of, you know, getting vehicles off the road that would have been kind of driving up and down motorways. And um, that really does help, I think, um, crystallize it for people in terms of, of kind of that, that real life example. 
So we, we might come now to some, some questions and we've had a few come in on the chat. Um, so what I might do is I, I might just, uh, maybe I'll put, put one of the questions to Peggy. So Peggy, I suppose one of the questions that came in is what is holding back the A or V or wave more hardware or software? And also I suppose, was the hype surrounded Magic Leap years ago? Do you think something similar with the metaverse at present? Yeah, so it's a little of both, but there are devices out there. So there are hardware devices, a number of virtual reality devices, and we're just starting to see more augmented reality. And again, that's a, a bit harder to, to build. Uh, HoloLens is another fully immersive augmented reality device from uh, Microsoft. So we do have devices. Some of it is still education on what those devices are capable of doing right now versus the hype because you don't want disappointment you don't want someone to try something out oh this doesn't work and you know put it on the shelf and they don't pick it up again for a decade that's not what we want to happen and frankly i mean just going to the second question that they're you know magically did have a, a great device they launched their initial device in 2018 I think an issue there was the mark, it was very early in the market. There was some hype around it. It was entirely pointed at consumers. And so the, the disappointment was it was being sold alongside a mobile phone that was very performant. A mobile phone could do all sorts of things. And this more expensive device had a very, very small um, ecosystem of applications. Uh, the cost was high and people weren't quite sure what to do with it in, in a, from a consumer perspective. And that was when the company pivoted back to focusing on corporates because there were things you could do at that moment with the technology in its current state. And frankly, I draw the analogy back to mobile phones again. The very first people who bought those were corporates, a lot of times traveling salespeople who you, previous to the mobile phone had to um, call to their office. They have to find a parking spot, a phone booth, make a call to the office, uh, you know, get directions on their next sales visit. Uh, that took time and now they could just make a phone call. And so there was a return on investment there. And that is the point that we're at right now with augmented reality. There is an absolute return on investment. I mean, going from three weeks to three days to train uh, new factory workers is, is a very solid metric. And so the, the focus needs to be about what these devices can do right now. And if I just move to the software side of things, the, a lot of the, um, you know, some of the delays there are just getting people to understand how you build really 3D applications. So a lot of the talent comes out of the gaming world uh, that we see in it as they're building corporate solutions because they're already involved with 3D applications. Now those 3D applications uh, in a gaming world are typically shown on a 2D device, your PC in front of you. And now that thing comes to life, you know? So you have 3D visualization like never before. It is, you know, you, if you're working on a car uh, with, you know, three people who aren't co-located with you, you can all be looking at the same CAD drawing of the car right in front of your eyes. You can all modify it. You can delete, you can annotate. It's, it really makes those kind of design experiences uh, come to life. And that's what's, what's possible today, but it's, it's getting you know, corporates to understand what these devices can do, getting the right developers trained up, understanding what they can take advantage, what they can leverage in, in these devices. So a solution can, can really pop. And it's just funny, but Niall, you talked about a fire safety solution. We just had uh, one in our factory the other day because we have to train our fact. We have a factory. We, we manufacture our product. We have to train our own factory in fire safety. Once a year, there's a compliance you know, box you have to check. And so we decided to build a uh, with a, one of our partners an app to do that. And I took the test the other day. I tell you, my heart was racing. I walked into our clean room. I had to look around for the fire. There it was blazing in the corner. It looked just like a fire, but it was digital. But I was in my, the physical clean room and I had to run to the to the wall to get the um, fire extinguisher, run back over. Uh, but it was like, it was real to me. <laughs> it was everything but the smoke, which maybe someday we'll, we'll incorporate. But it was, um, it's an awesome way to learn and to train. And uh, all of that is, is possible now. So we're trying just to focus on the here and now, 
the the things that we see, the some of the hype, I do believe all of that is capable, but it's gonna take some time. The devices will have to get smaller, lighter, more of a glasses format to reach that point. Great, great. Thanks, Jay, Peggy. Um, so do we have a question there that maybe I suppose it's kind of open to, to the panel. Um, so um, I suppose from to the panelists, do we have any experience or feedback on the adoption of mixed reality applications in industry? Olihan's app development, for example, do technicians love it? Is it too clunky? Does it improve workflow or hinder? Um, so welcome, any, any thoughts on that one? I can give you multiple examples of it, but I would say like to go back to the Irish Defence Forces, like they absolutely love it. I would say everyone we talk to down there, not only like they're sort of like, uh, I don't know if, anyone, if you've had experience dealing with soldiers, but typically they're quite cynical. And so particularly in the career, like they'd be there for two or three generations of, of soldier and like any new stuff, they're like, oh, what are we doing this for? Like, look at these new guys in with their shiny thing, like that'll be gone by the end of the week. But I would say almost exclusively, they put on the headset, they do the thing and they go, this is amazing. Like, and, and like, I don't say that just to sort of make our stuff, because it's not necessarily our content that they find amazing. It's the experience of putting on a headset and being able to sit in, the, in an environment and, and train as they would in the real world. And like, again, for me, it's back to like their, their access to the equipment. So like they would, not be able to sort of go in and or they, they would be afraid to go in and press buttons on the in the car yeah for fear of breaking it and then it takes out a commission where they can go in and they can just play and they can like you know well what happens if i do this and what happens if i move this thing over here and they can go in and make all those mistakes in the simulator before they have to go and do it for real which is something they've never been able to do before and, and exactly. yeah, so like, yeah, everyone who has this experience and as peggy described because it feels so real yeah which you all of a sudden then only realize when you have uh, a headset or from from any company on from from Google or from Quest or the latest Quest from from Meta is how real it feels and uh, I think it's also psychologically your brain is like in the real world you know, from a neuroscience point of view it's very interesting and the biggest cases I would say right now are what you described in the so-called in more industrial metaverse where you create together and one of the biggest companies very very active and there is Nvidia. Yeah, so NVIDIA is basically a building digital twins of whole factories like Siemens or BMW, and they they create the, the factory process is one thing, but also also health and safety, and also even the creation like for BMW of the cars, like Peggy described it, they do in 3D, they do globally, they can all of a sudden see not only from a design perspective, but also they don't need to do this painful, very expensive and not really uh, supporting sustainable processes of driving these cars. And that's the same with e-cars even, yeah? So it's, for me, it's not only the sky is the limit, it sometimes feels like there is no limit at one point, but there is also clearly, as Peggy said, a, a managing expectation. But when you get into this, like uh, stuff like in the NVIDIA does is amazing. The other thing which I really admire what they recently have done was obviously the entire play of other ecosystem, uh, other people in the ecosystem is digital twin of the earth. So they have created a digital twin of the earth. They're still creating it. This is not one thing um, to foresee climate changes, to do simulations and to help us to understand what does it mean if we take this or that action and have this basically this whole data gathering from Google Maps from all over the world, again, which is all available to pull this together to create something which is uh, really outstanding. And just one final point on that. Um, actually, we're working with NVIDIA and their Omniverse that they've been building. Yeah, it's exactly. awesome, yeah awesome platform. And, we worked with one of the do-it-yourself companies, Lowe's, um, and what they have done is uh, put the headsets on their uh, associates, the, the, their, the folks who work in their stores, and it helps them restocking. So you can go down uh, a physical store and look at an empty space, and that digital twin of what's supposed to be there can pop up. And a sort of a really positive outcome of that whole program is the empowerment that the associates feel, you know, particularly new ones. They don't have to run back and ask someone, where is this? The, the device can walk them to where the stock is. They can pick it up, bring it back to the shelf. It, there's far less uh, 
uh, dependency on others, which makes you feel very empowered. You put the device on and you can do your job by yourself. And th that was sort of a, a happy side benefit that we hadn't realized when we first started working with it as a tool. It's, it empowers employees and they actually feel very good about it. Yeah, I mean, talking, for example, to uh, Microsoft, the Microsoft lab for HoloLenses is in Zurich. So I'm based in Switzerland. And uh, what they do also similar, I think you will be very well aware, is that when you develop the HoloLenses, for sure, for the normal consumer, they are too expensive now. But also think about for people who have never done any operation in their, in their, uh, in their life. And then you live in very remote areas in Africa or so. There's still obviously doctors flying there. But how amazing that is that you can empower, to your point, someone who has absolutely not done anything like that before to do this kind of operation because you're helping him with all the augmented and virtual reality tools you have if you have obviously this kind of headset. So the point is also in this different um, in these different parts of the world, we can create more and better life standards. We can also create more inclusiveness. But what it means is, is bandwidth, for example. As we know, it needs a lot of bandwidth and, and a lot of energy, which we don't have available or in the form we want to have now. But it's up to us, you know, it's also there. We need to change the way we produce energy because we have a lot of uh, what we can use. And all of this when we talked about convergence and interconnectivity, everything of this is connected. So talking about this in, in silos doesn't help. And with the examples we have shown you, it's basically the, it's a whole ecosystem of different players who come together. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone, for, for the input on that one. And I suppose Kind of leading on from some of the discussion, you know, I suppose one of the questions there is how do you see the metaverse impacting on public service delivery? Is the focus now more on training, um, you know, a, a training simulation? So I think, you know, we, we can definitely see, again, I think it's back to return on investment, the point I think, Peggy, you were making that there's a very clear correlation between, you know, if you can reduce number of training days, you can get someone on to kind of working quicker. And um, so from an industry perspective or even public service perspective, it's it's quantifiable. And I think often in business, we want to be able to quantify the, the savings or the impact of, of a new technology. Um, Can I add something to that? Because yeah. there is, there in South Korea, they are very, very far, far advanced in public services. They have created, and there's something also in the US, I don't know which city that was, they have created a, a complete digital twin of uh, of the city yeah also we see from the government so also with the aspect of trying uh what is the infrastructure how can we improve infrastructure uh in terms of the entire uh, processes for buses for others and how can we make it more easy and in addition to that dealing with government as we know can be sometimes very painful in terms of documentation and everything you need. So they're also testing, they have government offices there where people can come, obviously they come as an avatar helping them. So they are all kind of different initiatives from the government and it's, uh, basically Seoul, South Korea is one in total also for, for everything they do in industry and in banking, most advanced in the metaverse. So they are really the, the primer, you can say from a country perspective, uh, they might not be on everyone's map, right? It's absolutely when you look at everything they have done and you can really find for every industry an example there. Anyone else on thoughts on that one or I can move on? Mm -hmm. Maybe just like briefly to talk, I don't know, it's probably more of a viewer thing, but like where, where it works really well for me, coming maybe from a filming background, is like being able to put people within experiences. So obviously training is a great way to do that, but but like I've seen a couple of really interesting use cases again in Ireland, like there's projects ongoing around like court service, making VR experiences that allow you to experience what it's like to go to court before you actually have to go there. So it's like, it's kind of training, but it's kind of exposure, pre-deployment therapy or whatever. Um, I know Peggy was talking a lot about medical use earlier, like one of the most interesting studies I found around VR, and it's, again, it's an old one, was using VR headsets as pain relief. So there's a, I can't remember exactly the details of it, so I'm going to try and fudge it, but like, don't quote me the science on this. But broadly, it was people who were getting burn dressings changed, and they did a A-B study with morphine versus a VR headset. And 
what they were doing is putting people in VR headsets in like really cold environments. So like looking at penguins in the Antarctic or whatever the environment was, and their tolerance for the level of pain they could appreciate was much higher than even compared to the morphine treatment. And it had a longer lasting effect too. So the morphine would wear off over time. Yeah, so like, I think this, yeah. There are companies specialized on these topics who deal with therapy. So really, as you say, post-traumatic, also for people who come from Afghanistan, for example, or even during operations, you know how painful it is, yeah. Because you, even though you maybe are uh, under anesthesia, you, you you still have that feeling. So there is a whole range in medical healthcare and um, healthcare spectrum uh, where companies are focusing on the different basically parts of it. And uh, one of the points which connect all of this and all of our discussions is obviously uh, digital identity and data. Right now, in particular, also in medical healthcare, as we know, uh, when we go to the doctor, he has some data, we have some data maybe from wearables, and, and then when we travel to another country, then there's another data set. And that is a huge problem because ideally, like we see now in Web3 is in, in everything that you own your data. So you have a digital wallet, you have a digital identity, you could have uh, what we call a soulbound token. Uh, and this is also already there. And, and that part of the whole equation of what we have discussed about, uh, apart from the personal data uh, point, is really who owns the data and how can I make sure I, it's my data, uh, it's not Amazon uh, dealing with it. So I, I give what I want to give here. I want to give my health data here. I want to give the other data, yeah? So this is a, a huge topic uh, for discussion and obviously also for regulation. So another question that's come in and whatever we've done, we've landed the message because someone says there's no denying the transformative power of immersive technologies, which is great. Um, how do the panel see more mainstream adoption and readiness of industry to invest in VR, AR, XR, seen as a high barrier of entry to creating the content? Would you agree there's a high barrier of entry? And I suppose how then do we kind of get industry more kind of ready to invest in this? I think there are huge investments. There are huge investments. I mean, and Peggy will say more, but there are 120 billion of VC investments alone in VC investments. And then others are investing too. And if you think about the daily consumer, if you start with what Peggy emphasized, the augmented reality, you have Shopify, yeah, you have IKEA, you have all these companies who are already into augmented reality. So changing the way we we shop and e-commerce is huge it's another billion industry where we see a lot then the guys the whole fashion industry is into it so there are huge investments already made peggy but you sorry yeah I, and i think you know a big tailwind for this whole industry was meta um facebook changing their name to meta talking about the 10 billion a year they're spending in this space that drew a lot of additional investment around it um, but some of the actual barriers are, I, and I touched on this already, is, you know, developers, we need to train developers in this medium, really, because it is a new type of medium, similar to uh, games, but but different in that, you know, it, you you are looking at things in a in a in a very spatial way. It's it's, you know, we some people do call this, you know, spatial computing, because you're actually uh, modifying the space, the actual physical space around you. And there's a there's a fair amount of training to get a developer up and running. But going back to ROI, and again, I'm, I'm going to draw back to my mobile phone past. Um, when when we uh, when the industry came out with mobile phones, I, I was working at Qualcomm. And I remember we put into the chip the capability to the, the TCIP um, protocols so that you could actually build data uh, and run applications on the phone. And I remember, you know, a lot of the, the CEOs of the telcos at the time saying, why would you want to do that? You know, <laughs> so sometimes you get a little bit of hate, like the, the technology is a little bit ahead of what people think they can do with it. And, but as soon as people saw that they could earn money, uh, for instance, if you remember way back in the beginning, it was ringtones. There was all different sorts of ringtones and we would pay, you know, like $1.99 for a ringtone. And that drew the developers. So when once the developers see an ROI, a reason to develop on another platform, you know, and, and now it's, you know, do I develop on iOS? Do I develop on, 
on Android? Do I develop in a Unity uh, environment? You, they have to make choices. They have a, you know, they have limited resources. But if you can show an ROI to those developers, they will come. And that's what we're working on. We have a big focus on the developer community in AR and um, getting them to understand that there's real value here. Uh, and you know, solid metrics help, like, like some of the ones I've mentioned already. And that that then breaks the dam and they they start to come. And we are definitely seeing that. But it, but again, no doubt that meta announcement did a lot for the industry to sort of wake people up to the opportunity. Probably double down on almost everything Peggy has said there, like and maybe pick up two specific points. First being developers, and, and like for us, like obviously that's our biggest challenge all the time is trying to find suitably qualified developers to to build the content. And in fact, like we have often been in a position where we have more work than we have developers able to do the work for us. Um, and like to sort of go back to my previous life at working in film and TV, like we're kind of at the point with that industry now where like anyone with a mobile phone can make content almost at a professional level that can be uploaded to YouTube. And you know, like I watch sort of YouTube videos with the kids where kid, people are making them with sort of gimbals with sort of GoPros and gimbals and stuff. And like the, the means of production is quite available and very cost effective for that industry. And so there's an abundance of content. And I feel like that's probably what this industry needs is like the the, the amount of content being produced or the amount of people able to produce content to increase. And I think that will come with time as, as people sort of start to get interested in it. And then from the other end of the spectrum, I guess it's, it's the user part. And like we've been doing this five or six years now and like, at that time, you know, you were going to people and it was their first time using a VR headset, but really, and it feels like, I don't know if COVID changes or maybe it's, maybe it's the meta stuff, but like we've had increasingly experiences where people come to us and say, I tried VR in my brother-in-law's house over Christmas and we were playing something and I had an idea of how that could work for, for my business. Um, and so like, I feel like the more people who use the technology, the more good ideas are going to come out to it, come out of it. And, and again, back to Peggy's point, like, why do you need data on a chip? Well, someone somewhere is going to work out a reason why that's going to be beneficial. And just the more people who are using it, the more good ideas are going to come out, I think. I think that is a super point that we also, that's uh, why I say everyone has to be kind of the shaper uh, because we get more creativity yeah. as a as a community as well. And we cannot think about the Facebook right now uh, of, of the metaverse. I mean, there are similar things, but what I mean is something so mind changing that uh, that there uh, we need to get more people into it. And not only, as you say, the developers, but everyone can be a creator in that sense. Yeah? And what are your pain, pain, uh, pain points and how how can we uh, how can we solve them? One of your yeah. sorry, sorry, you think I'd be better at it than at, at this stage, but I just want to pick up on, on, on some of the points raised there, just in terms of um, you know, the impact of this technology and I suppose the ideas that you know just even trying it, it can it can spark with people. Um I suppose your own comments in terms of you know the way immersive technologies can be used for you know the future of work and the hybrid working and remote working um and i suppose the the role it can play in in that sphere obviously it's a, it's an issue that's kind of up for a lot of debate at the moment um so so welcome your thoughts on that one yeah i'd like to jump in on that one i think one of the ideas that you know people would love to see is the fact that, well, maybe I don't have to get on a plane and cross the country to go to a physical meeting if the experience is as good as or as close to a, a physical meeting right here at my house or in the office. And that we're still a little a ways from that. We can, obviously you can put the headsets on anywhere where you can all look at the same digital content and modify it. But if we, if we want that experience where we are, seeing people as they are, that requires a lot of cameras. And that that seems, again, you know, you see it, you see a video of something and, you know, everybody's in the same room. Um, in order for that to actually occur, uh, so Una, if you had the headset on and, and you were in Ireland and I was in the States, you would have to have a bunch of cameras on you so that that image could be packaged up and sent to me so I could see you as if you were standing there. And we, we just don't have that yet. Um, Actually, Cisco is coming out with something called WebEx Hologram early next year, and that'll it'll come very close to that. They do have a set of cameras. Uh, it's a it's a, a beautiful setup, but 
you know, that is what's going to be required for a real true 3D experience. Now, many times we don't actually need that. If you're meeting someone for the first time, I think you'd want that. But if you've met them already, that's where you see, you know, you could, they could be replaced with an avatar, you know, and they could be walking around that automotive that you're both designing and you could be, um, you know, talking to each other. By the way, the spatial audio is really wonderful in these devices. So if, if you walk behind me, I hear you walk behind me. Um, because we have eye tracking, we know where your eyes are looking. So if an avatar comes up and looks at me right in my eyes, I, I see that. You actually feel that presence. So we get close to it in, in the current technology, but where we need to be, I think, for real truly, true 3D meetings to take the place of a physical meeting is still a little ways off, and we'll need those cameras in place. Yeah, also the avatars, I, I would also not underestimate them, as, as you say, for certain use cases, uh, because once you have, it's very interesting for us also to watch when we uh, have experiences with, with people joining us and their first time doing their avatars, their first thing, or oh, the avatar has nothing to do with me, but once you have one, you want you want this to be the expression of yourself. Yeah, so some obviously have a uh, you know fish on the head or whatever but most of the people who start first who are in our age they are more um they like to have it more like themselves yeah? so with was one of the applications with ready player one you can do the the photography and will be in, in your avatar so that's for normal consumers it's not the highly sophisticated you mentioned but also with the quest 3 we have tested this now uh, it's it's still expensive for normal because it's 1,600 US dollars. You can have the eye tracking. And that's the first time it's a bit, it's like, wow, because the eyes are the most important in in communication. That's uh, what, what also reports have shown. So what, once you see that, as, as Peggy mentioned, it feels more real, even in an avatar, because when you raise your eyebrows or so, the, the avatar will raise the eyebrows. So it's, <laughs> when you first see that, oh my God, you know, this other person has much more expression. So. Maybe like uh, Adar making an adjacent point to all of those as well, which is like when we're talking about avatars and maybe to open this out to a broader metaverse discussion, I guess that, you know, do you want to have 20 different avatars for the 20 different products that you're interacting with on a daily basis? Like, so if you're in a metaverse, like, and, and I think, I feel like this is probably one of the bigger problems that needs to be solved for this to become a lot more mainstream is, you know, do I want to have a Facebook avatar that's different to my Google avatar that's different to my whatever work avatar? And like, probably not. And do I need to want to be switching between them all the time? Like, probably not. And so I, I think one of the things that the internet early days did very well is set a sort of common standard. So like a website will display as a website will display as a website. And so it, it, I, I haven't really seen, and maybe it's happening in the background, but like much discussion on how a common metaverse standard is going to be applied that allows, you know, the meta metaverse to talk to the Google metaverse, talk to the Microsoft metaverse, and for people, consumers to move seamlessly between all of those different um there, there are actually two standard forums. Um, one is around Meta, Nvidia, and so on. And another one is uh, um, also very much driven by what we call the open metaverse. Yeah. So there are two forums, but obviously they they have uh, started at the beginning of the year to exactly do this. And you have for the avatars, you also have Ready Player One, which is an application which gives you the possibility to use your avatar already in, in a number of different worlds. The challenge is, as you say, some are blockchain, some are not blockchain, uh, but there are also now people who are building bridges but it, this is the part of the technical side. But I would also say that what we noticed was in the beginning, you start with one avatar and you dress it differently depending on the location, like in real life. The more advanced you are, like you are when you also game, you want not one avatar. Maybe for your party avatar, you want to be a minotaur or you want to be a unicorn. Yeah. But as there are no standards right now, can you be a unicorn? Obviously, when you show up at work, maybe not depending, but depending on your work, if you are in a creative job, maybe you can gamma as a unicorn. Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, it's quite, it can be quite creative as well. But well, one of the company's driving standards there is NVIDIA with their Omniverse because they want to transfer this, this 3D graphics data using USD universal scene description. So there is starting to be some um, 
momentum around USD across platforms. And, and the good thing with the development of the virtual worlds and the augmented worlds is there is more collaboration at the start now. I think they saw what happened with the internet where we had to fit things into the internet over time. It's like, let's get it right in the beginning. And so there is more collaboration across the big tech companies to start to standardize on some of these descriptors. Yeah, one of the, let's say, partially surprising even partnership was in October between Microsoft and uh, Meta. Yeah, and this is huge because for, for working uh, Microsoft, as we know, Microsoft Teams has hundreds of millions. Uh, the office suite is used by 345 million of people. And they now have a cooperation strategic partnership, which I believe, I mean, for Meta is a no-brainer because they can extend the reach. Mm -hmm. And Microsoft has their own application, not Meta or Horizon, but uh, Microsoft Mesh which can be used with the our, with our goggles or basically or with a headset. And it has been already tested with Accenture for the last two years, what is called the seventh floor, I believe, where 150,000 people were, were testing this. And just imagine now instead of Zoom, because Microsoft has such a strong base, we usually everyone uses Microsoft Teams, then you can imagine how the acceleration of adoption also can be through this partnership. But to Peggy's point, uh, what I found amazing that, obviously for commercial reasons, but my, even Microsoft and Meta are now having this kind of partnerships sir. Uh, but on the other side is two big giants coming together. So it will be quite nice, like others as well. And NVIDIA is one of the super, I love NVIDIA because they're doing what is called the Omniverse, but they also are open. They create an open metaverse, yeah? So where you don't have what we call the walled gardens. So NVIDIA is really one of the top companies, I think, for people to get closer to. I suppose just one other question, I think I suppose it goes back to kind of the discussion we we're having there about kind of common metaverse standards. In terms of the panelists, I suppose, what risks do you see as being kind of particularly serious with immersive technologies? Um, and what would you think needs to be done to address or prevent such risks? And, you know, I suppose as policymakers, what should be done to regulate against such risks? I mean, again, I, I always caution don't over regulate until we have the thing in place. But, uh, you know, just uh, welcome your thoughts in terms of where you think the risks are, what can be done to mitigate them? Um, and then I suppose the policy side. Yeah, I, I'd love to jump in on that because we've been thinking about it for a long time. The company that, that I'm involved with, Magic Leap, is about 12 years old. And, and the founder was deeply focused on privacy. And the reason is because these devices are bristling with sensors much more than your mobile phone. You know, you've got four cameras looking at your eyes. You've got five world cameras looking out at your, uh, at your world and a lot of data passing in between and, and you know, more sensors to come uh, because it is body worn. We can actually add more, you know, physical body sensors uh, over time. We're, we're not doing that right now, but you can imagine something that's touching your body can add those sorts of sensors. So we've been thinking about that for a long time and we've tried from, the, from day one to be absolutely locked down on privacy, security, that's very personal data. You know, four cameras looking out of your eyes, we know who you are and, and only you should get to say <laughs> where that data goes, the user. And um, so, it, so what we've tried to do is work right away with regulators, let them first of all know what these devices are capable of doing so they understand that. Because so they don't try to fit in an old regulatory framework into a new, technology that never seems to work. And then to talk about how we smartly regulate going forward, you know, allowing for innovation, but understanding the need to keep um, user data private, secure, and within your own, um, er, you know, uh, responsibility as to whether you release that data or not. So, so it's going to be a big issue if we don't stay on top of it, just because the devices are much more, um, much more personal than a mobile phone even. Yeah, I'd like to, can I come in that one too? Because I guess as a company, what we do is is data that comes out of your and, and seeing what is possible to come out of it. I would absolutely, again, agree with what Peggy said there. And like, it's great to hear Magic Leap are taking that approach. But I would say not every company is taking that approach. And maybe that's where regulation has to come in. And, and like, there's always that fear of like, you know, you see what's happened in Twitter. You know, all it takes is one 
not so benevolent owner to come in and say, well, I'm taking over and I'm going to do this my way now. So without the regulation being there, it's like you're reliant on companies like Magic Leap enforcing it themselves. Um, and like, again, I, I would be probably similar to what you said, Dylan, like don't over-regulate, but at the same time, like I, I guess regulators need to be aware of what's possible coming out of these devices. And, and like what I keep going back to, similar to what Peggy's saying there and tracking your eyes, like one of our data scientists said, like he can work out pretty accurately who an individual is based on just on their wide displacement or their height, basically. So how high the headset is off the ground, you can tell to a reasonable degree of actually who the person who's using the headset is. And so we capture, I think, 220 data points per frame of VR. So like straight away, you can get a lot of information on, on and really personal information on people. And so standards that say, this is how that data has to be stored. This is who owns the data. And for me, it's always the individual's data. Like we only see anonymized and what can be done with it afterwards. So like, again, we as a company would never sell that on. And like in our contracts with the customers, we specifically put in, we don't own and we will never resell this data. Whereas I would say, and like, again, without naming companies and getting myself in trouble, but like there are certain headset manufacturers who part of their business model is the headset is discounted to purchase, but we are making the value of it back based on the data we're capturing as the person as it goes through the VR experience. And so like that for me, and like, you know, seeing what some of the bigger players in VR have done previously with their internet data, that for me is a huge risk actually to us as a company, because all it takes is one company like that to do something bad that, you know, then pulls the whole industry down because it becomes, well, you know, see what see what you can do with the data and like, um, and then everyone else like falls down because of it. Yeah, I would also say it's a call for urgency uh, because from everything we have heard so far, it's already quite advanced. So that regulators really get involved now and not after one of the companies, as you described it, does something really awful and, and off here yeah, because that is for the whole rest of the people who develop and who create and who are really passionate about it is, is a nightmare. So the data point, the uh, gathering for, of behavioral data, and you mentioned that before, Now we need not something which is detailed uh, because we cannot imagine all the use cases, but it should be something which sets certain standards. Yeah? And for me, um, what I haven't seen yet, why it's regulators like also the, in Germany when the debate was there, they talk about it, but none of them has ever tried a device on you know, how can the Deutsche Bundestag, all the politicians talk about it, then they have all the experts there and have never tried a device. This is our incredible. So from that point of view, uh, probably their kids would know better, some of them at least, than themselves. Uh, it's Magic Leap, like you said, certainly will offer that. Your company will offer that. We, we offer that. There are tons of companies where regulators can say, can I try? We also work with regulators in Switzerland. They come. There's CRs we and and they try on stuff and they have, uh, try to understand. So I think this is the way how it should be. You get involved. You you know what you're talking about, yeah. Because with a smartphone, it's fine. We know what the smartphone does or doesn't do right now. But with with a headset, is still a bit of an unexplored area, I would say. And I suppose you know, just from my own perspective, you know, we can see kind of what's coming from the, the European perspective, you know, files coming down on AI and data. So um, I suppose if you cover some aspects of, of metaverse, but not all, and I suppose the, the broader question is also, you know, we, we see kind of Europe sometimes, you know, moves ahead in these areas, but, you know, perhaps an OECD approach, um, you know, a broader than just Europe approach. And, um, you know, we see the difficulties that arose, obviously Europe goes ahead with GDPR, but, then you're left kind of dealing with the consequences then of like last week, the transatlantic data flow and things like that. So um, I suppose, yeah, just from, from your perspective, obviously Europe, you know, tends to take a lead on some of the, the regulatory areas as it should and, you know, very much in that kind of Eurocentric uh, values. But I suppose sometimes we, we, we have to try and look to who, who are we working with in this space um, and if there's other, you know, geo uh, regions that can maybe work with us um, in developing those standards. Yeah, and it's also interesting, uh, you know, you should look beyond Europe, you know, because I mean, like the internet is it's all global. And we have talked about health and all the other areas is all global. And this is just, it was already in the internet is all global. But in my view here, it's even more. So you could basically 
you need to have a forum which is global, like the UN or something, which is dealing with this massive shift of society, which is happening now, is also different, in my view, from certain perspectives, what you can do with all the virtual worlds and everything we have talked about, uh, different from what the internet was. So it's even more, even more, more uncomprehensible in certain senses, but also more, more possibilities there. So from that point of view, it's, it's even including the Mars and the, where they have the NASA uh, testing and trying which suits they should have going on top of the world, so to speak, or beyond the world. So it's a big, big thing. So in my view, really, you should get uh, the top people together to to also think about it and not over-regulate, but see what are the possibilities, what are the use cases, work with the companies, work with those who are actually on the ground, like Magic Leap or NVIDIA or others to do it, which is happening in parts, I would say. That's great. Well, I think we are we are nearly at time. So I, I want to end by thanking um, our wonderful panelists. Uh, thank you so much for your, your time and your insights today. So to Marta, to Niall, to Peggy, thank you so much. Um, on behalf of myself, I'd like to thank IIEA and IDA Ireland for organising the event. It's been really interesting and um, definitely thought provoking and, um, you know, definitely kind of sets us in good stand, stead to, to continue this conversation in terms of both from the policymakers perspective, but also from, from the industry perspective as well. So thank you all for your time. And I'm sure uh, on behalf of the IAA to say have a lovely Christmas and um, look forward to welcoming you to another event soon.